Thank you, Mason. A memorial may be defined as something to preserve the memory of a person, an event, an experience, something special to us. And it can, can be in the form of a monument or a periodic observance. And in keeping with that definition, this nation has many memorials, both in the form of monuments and periodic observances. We have one tomorrow. Um, in fact, we call it Memorial Day. And it is to preserve the memory of many men and women who have paid the ultimate price. They have given their lives in service to this country for principles that they believe in. And for that, we're very grateful. Um, many men and women serve, some are here this morning, who have served in the military, maybe are serving, and you were willing or are willing to do that, to give your life, and we appreciate that as well. But since our minds in this nation are on the subject of memorials, uh, I thought it would be appropriate if we also study that subject because the Bible speaks of many memorials, both in the form of monuments and periodic observances. We see both in Old Testament as well as New Testament. Well, let's begin our study in Psalm 103. If you would turn with me over to Psalm 103, please. And I thank you for following along with me in the scriptures. In Psalm 103, verse 1, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Now, in spite of the Holy Spirit's admonition here, we all know of man's tendency to forget, a tendency we would all readily admit. Events, experiences, even people, once important to us, can be forgotten. And of course, God knows that better than anyone. And so, in numerous places throughout Scripture, knowing our tendency to forget, the Holy Spirit admonishes us, as He does here in Psalm 103, don't forget don't forget how he pardons iniquity and heals us of sicknesses and diseases and redeems our life from the pit and showers us with blessings each and every day, many of which we have forgotten, have we not? And so God establishes memorials to help us remember. Because when we don't remember, when we do forget, do we realize we are robbing God of the honor and the glory and the thanksgiving he deserves every day? And brethren, when we forget the many benefits of the Lord, let me tell you, bad things begin to happen. Spiritually speaking, especially. Look with me at a couple of examples. Judges chapter 2. Go back with me there, please. Judges chapter 2. In verse 8. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. Verse 9. They buried him in the territory of his inheritance in Timnat Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. There arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, 
nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. And then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Look at this. Think of all the marvelous things that God had done, all the miracles, right? The parting of the Jordan River so that all 12 tribes can cross over into the land of Canaan. The walls of Jericho falling down. The sun standing still in Gibeon during one of their battles. Think of all the marvelous things that God had done. The conquest of the land itself was by the hand of God. And yet they forgot the Lord their God just one generation after Joshua. Just one generation. And there are consequences for that. They started serving the Baals, the gods of, of men. In verse 13, so they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Astartes. And the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he gave them into the hands of plunderers who plundered them and sold them into the hands of their enemies around them so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. The Lord was robbed of his honor, and eventually he gives the Israel over to their sin. Terrible things happen, bad things happen when we forget the wonderful wonderful blessings of the Lord. We see the same thing in the book of Jeremiah many years later, later Jeremiah chapter 2, Jeremiah chapter 2, and verse 32, the prophet also speaks of a time when Israel forgot the many blessings of the Lord. Verse 32, can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people, God's bride Israel, my people, have forgotten me days without number. Now, because Israel had forgotten the source of all their blessings, and God had eventually rejected Israel and gave them over to the hands of their enemies a nation even more wicked than they were, Habakkuk says. But nonetheless, they were God's instrument in punishing Israel because they forgot the source of their blessings. Now, to help us preserve the memory of the things we should never forget, then memorials are established. And we see, again, a number of examples of memorials in the Bible, both monuments and various observances. In Joshua chapter 4, we see a monument set up as a memorial. Joshua chapter 4, speaking of the time when God did part the Jordan River. Joshua chapter 4 and verse 4. Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross again to the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan. And each of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Let this be a sign among you so that when your children ask later saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. And so here is a memorial in the form of a monument, a stone memorial. And not only for that generation, but for generations to come. Exodus chapter 12, we read of an annual observance set up as a memorial, the Passover, Exodus chapter 12. Exodus 12, let's um, begin at verse 14 here, please. Now this day will be a memorial to you. 
and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. And of course, we're talking here about the Passover, the first great feast of Israel. Verse 23, let's drop down to there, please. Verse 23. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses and smite you. Look at this, verse 26. And it will come about when your children will say, what does this right mean to you? God's always thinking ahead to future generations, and now 2,000 years ahead past the Lord's Supper in Luke 22. You shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians but spared our homes. And the people bowed low and worshiped. The rainbow was both a covenant and a memorial. Aaron's rod, a pot of manna that never spoiled, the Ten Commandments on stone tablets, all were housed in the box or the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, and all three were to serve as memorials, remembrances. The Sabbath day observance, the weekly observance that uh, was commanded by God for Israel. It was not only a day of rest, the Bible shows us, but in Deuteronomy 5, it was intended to be a time when Israel on that day remembered their freedom from bondage, from slavery in Egypt, and how God with a mighty hand led them out of Egyptian slavery. That was the memorial aspect of it. Now, knowing our tendency to forget even important things, God has established a very, very important memorial for Christians today. And Mason read Luke's account of that memorial. In the New Testament, we have one uh, observance memorial, and that is of God's only Son. We are to never, ever forget the terrible suffering and the death that he bore for us, every pain for us, every ounce of anguish for us. We must never forget that. And to help us remember this extremely important sacrifice, the most important event in all history, God set up a very, very simple memorial, a simple supper, Think about it. It's not the face of his son in the side of a mountain. It's not even a tombstone in a graveyard somewhere. It's a simple supper of unleavened bread and fruit of the vine to remember God's dear son. It's a sacrifice and then a partaking emblematically of that sacrifice. Look with me at Matthew's account now. We've read Luke's account. Look at Matthew's account. Matthew 26. In Matthew 26 and verse 26. And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing, after thanking God, he broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is to be shed on behalf of many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, Jesus is instituting this memorial supper. And he's doing it in a manner that's in keeping with the ancient manner in which a covenant was made. Typically, when a covenant was made, you have a sacrifice. You have agreements between parties, and then you have a sacrifice. 
And after the agreement is made, after there's harmony and unity and, and fellowship between the two parties, then there is a meal. You partake of a portion of that sacrifice. And that also denotes fellowship, harmony, unity between the two parties. Now, in this case, Christ is both the covenant maker and he's the sacrifice. And so the covenant is, is made. You're in the kingdom. You're one of his citizens. You're one of his children. And Jesus is saying, I'm partaking with you. I am in fellowship with you. And in just a few minutes, when we observe this memorial supper, our Lord and Savior will be observing this with us. That's his promise. The kingdom is, is here. It's been established. Acts chapter 2 shows its beginning. And from that point on, all who come into the kingdom, they break bread with the Lord every Lord's day. And so here we are, seeking to show great reverence and respect, just as the Lord teaches us here in Matthew 26, remembering him. He's the sacrifice emblematically. Metaphorically, we're partaking of his body and his blood. This is not a sacrament. This is not literal body and, and literal blood. With his, all his blood, 100% of it running through his body, Jesus said, this is my blood. Speaking metaphorically. And of course, if it were literal blood, that would be a violation of the law. The law forbade the eating of blood, literal blood. But emblematically, metaphorically, Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, because he's not only the covenant maker, he's also the sacrifice. And so we have the great privilege of remembering him in this very, very simple supper. Acts chapter 20 shows the time, Acts chapter 20, when saints did observe it. A statement is made early on, soon after the kingdom begins in Acts 2, that they continually devoted themselves to this, as well as the, the fellowship and the apostles' doctrine and prayer. They continually devoted themselves to this. Well, in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, we find that it was a regular observance on every first day of the week. Because it says in Acts 20, verse 7, upon the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread. Now think about that, to break bread. If Christians came together every Sunday, which we know they did, we know they came together every Sunday. 1 Corinthians 16, as I directed the churches of Galatia upon the first day of every week, we know they came together every first day of the week. And if they did, then we know they also broke bread. How do we know that? Because Acts 20 verse 7 says, upon the first day of the week, when we had gathered together to break bread. They came together to break bread. Every week has a Sunday. You notice that, that Luke, in writing it this way, doesn't elevate one Sunday above another. He doesn't elevate or demote the Sunday. He says, upon the first day of the week. He doesn't focus on one particular Sunday. He says, upon the first day of the week. So we observe it today, and now tomorrow we may ask, so when do we observe it again? And where are you going to end up? Right back here in Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Upon the first day of the week, they came together to break bread. And next Monday, you'll end up at the same place because all Sundays are treated equally. In the same manner, God said to Israel, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Israel understood God meant every Sabbath day because he didn't lift one above another. They're all to be treated equally. And can we be continually devoted to it and do it any less than one day a week? The Lord's Supper, as all acts of worship, is not an end to itself. 
There's no blessing in merely eating that bread. There's no blessing in merely drinking the fruit of the vine. But it is the way commanded by the Lord himself to remember his death, the covenant relationship that exists between us and all of the marvelous eternal blessings that we will have in heaven as a result of what he did for me and for you. Well, this morning, let's, let's get into what the Apostle Paul said, what may be the earliest writing, the earliest uh, written revelation of the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11. Let's look over there what Paul had to say about it. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning there, verse 17. Verse 17, Paul says, in giving this instruction, I can't praise you. He says this to the Corinthian church. He says, because you come together, and it's not for the better, but it's for the worse. Now, the Apostle Paul is about to address the subject of the memorial supper because of an abuse. But in the process of correcting the abuse, he gives us, once again, the same instruction of Matthew 26. He reaffirms what the Lord had said and recorded in Matthew, it's recorded for us in what we read in Matthew 26, Luke 22. As I said, this may be, though, the earliest written record of that, somewhere in the latter 50s. Verse 18, for in the first place, when you come together as a church. I want you to see that before we continue on here because this is a, a statement just like Acts 20 verse 7 that shows us that when Christians observe this memorial, it was always together. It was an assembly of saints. It was not intended to be you taking it off in a corner somewhere and observing it off in a corner. Every example of Christians observing this memorial supper, they come together. And that's part of the beauty of it, isn't it? Jesus says you share in the body. You share in the blood. As we observe, we're in fellowship. Remembering that this above everything else is our hope. Jesus Christ crucified. Christians did this together. In verse 18, Paul continues, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part, I believe it. So this, this is the problem going on in Corinth. There's a division, and I believe from the context here, brethren, you study it for yourself, but I believe from the context, it seems to be between those who had and those who, who didn't have, rich and poor. Some had plenty, and I get the picture from this that those who had means they were bringing them to the assembly. They brought the bread, they brought the fruit of the vine, and they brought plenty for themselves, but they weren't thinking of others. Others who didn't have means, who came hoping to do this, intending to do this, but they had no means of that bread or fruit of the vine. And Paul says of those who did, they were coming, and they were going ahead and consuming what they had not waiting on anybody else. If you look ahead of verse 33, he says, wait for each other, tarry for one another. One of the, again, beauties of this is doing this together and being reminded we're all in this together. This is a fellowship. This is a covenant relationship we all enjoy. Do this together. But they, they evidently were consuming this these items without concern for others and treating it as a common meal. Verse 20, Paul says, therefore, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. In your eating, each one takes his own supper first. One is hungry, another is drunk. So instead of being the Lord's Supper, it had become their supper. Instead of being united, they were divided. Instead of serving one another, as Jesus had done, they were serving themselves. And instead of honoring Christ, honoring themselves. Brethren, the Lord's Supper is a memorial of the most loving, unselfish act ever done. 
And in tragic irony here, the Corinthians had turned it into a self-serving meal. They were acting the complete opposite of the one they were supposed to be honoring. They were unloving, they were selfish, and they were unmerciful. So Paul says in verse 22, what? Do you not have houses in which to eat or drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? I will praise you not. And so Paul rebukes this selfish behavior. He says, this is inexcusable. This is not a common meal, but they had made it a common meal. And so Paul says, in all practicality, if you're hungry, eat at home. Don't bring the elements to the assembly here and consume them without waiting on others. This is shameful behavior, and it leaves nothing to commend. We'll look back now. We, we skipped over verse 18. Look, at, look back at verse, verse 19, rather. Look at verse 19. For there must also be factions among you in order that those who are approved may have become evident among you. You know, God's purpose can be served even when men do things like this. God's purpose can be served even when men make foolish and sinful decisions. The crucifixion of Jesus forever proves that truth. God made good out of these evil choices of men. In the midst of, of spiritual struggles, spiritual struggles, true character is shown. True heart fruit comes forth and is proven. God uses occasions like this, he said, to sift. True and false disciples are proven in occasions like this. As a professional jeweler sees the pure and the flawed gems against a black velvet background. So when dark trials come into our lives, as he's speaking of here, Paul says, the righteous shine forth in the glory of their father. It doesn't wear them down. It just polishes them. Trials sift. And they help good-hearted people become even stronger. As in this congregation. Verse 23, Paul continues, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so the apostle Paul reaffirms the purpose that Jesus had for it on, on that night before his betrayal and arrest. I want you to notice, especially from the words here, Paul says, and Jesus says, this suffering is for us. His shed blood and covenant is for us. Every pain he suffered, every ounce of anguish, every drop of blood for us. It's not just that we remember his death, not just that we remember his suffering. We must remember it's for us that he did that. And without that suffering and death, we have no hope. Verse 26, Paul continues, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so Jesus suffered and died for us, but he didn't stay dead. As Psalm 16, David said, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. And Peter quotes that passage from David written a thousand years earlier, and he said, he's arisen. We serve a risen Savior. Go ahead and try to find his body. You're not going to find it. We serve a risen Savior. And so we proclaim to one another and to the world the great love of Jesus and his sacrifice 
and the power of his resurrection. The power of his death and the power of his resurrection. It's a powerful sermon that you're about to proclaim to the world. Until he comes again, we proclaim this message that we glory in the cross of Jesus Christ. We don't glory in ourselves. We glory in the cross of Jesus. Because of ourselves, we need that cross. Verse 27, therefore, Paul says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, the shameful manner in which the Corinthians were acting was the kind of attitude, the very attitude that made Jesus' sacrifice necessary in the first place. Because people treat one another in this very selfish, unmerciful way, Jesus suffered and he died. They're going against the very reason he died. And so verse 28, Paul says, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now, the worthy or unworthy manner, uh, verse 27 there, is in reference to Christ's purpose revealed in verse 23 through 25. The bread representing his body, the cup representing his blood. It's not in reference, brethren, to personal merit, our personal worthiness. None of us are worthy in that sense. But partaking worthily in context is an humble reverence for Jesus' sacrifice and death. That's worthy. Let us examine ourselves, making sure that's where our heart and our mind is. If we observe, as Jesus teaches us to observe in a worthy manner, thinking of him, then it should stir us to greater love, greater action. It should motivate us to even greater faith. Verse 29, Paul says this. He says, he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. The Apostle Paul again, focuses on the gravity of this memorial. Judgment, he says, to yourselves if we do not partake worthily. Now, it's important to understand, though, that Paul's not talking about the final judgment of all men. Though if we don't repent, and, and this doesn't stir us as it should, and we, we, we turn back to the world, it will lead to that eventually a heart that's unprepared for eternity. But the judgment here in context uh, is the same judgment Paul speaks of in verse 31 and 32. Look there, please. If we judged ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord. See, that's something happening right now. We are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. And so what Paul is talking about is in context here is the discipline or the chastisement of the Lord because he loves us, because he wants us to be with him someday in heaven. And because we're, we're not obeying his word, because we're not listening to him, we're not showing reverence as we should, those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He chastens every son in whom he delights. Do not reject the discipline of the Lord. That's the kind of discipline or judgment he's talking about in context, so that we will repent and we will be right with him. Going back to uh, verse 30, we see three terms here. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. The term weak uh, is used in the New Testament for both physical and spiritual weaknesses. Sickly, sickly is a term used five times. And again, it could be physical or it could be spiritual, though usually it is physical. But it could be either one. And then when Paul says sleep, 
It's a common metaphor for death. Common metaphor for death. Some in Corinth were spiritually asleep. And this was just a symptom of that fact. And some of them were spiritually dead. And they needed to wake up. And we need each other to help stay awake. Verse 33, Paul then summarizes or concludes this, uh, this context. He says, so then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. Do this together. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you may not come together for judgment. And the remaining matters I shall arrange when I come back. So what about those? We, we see the teaching of Paul here. What about those who simply ignore it or neglect it altogether? I'll leave you to, to think about that. And so in 1 Corinthians 11, we see four ways, four ways to look at Calvary. First, we need to look back. We need to look back to the suffering of Jesus for us. Secondly, we need to look within. Look within. Let each one examine himself to make sure we're looking back. Third, we need to look without. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And so we're preaching every Sunday one of the best lessons we can preach to the world. We glory in the cross of Jesus. And then fourth, we need to look forward until he comes again. He's coming back to call his own home. But to look forward with hope, we need to be looking back in reverence and humility. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. It's a gift. By grace, are you saved through faith? Everything good we have in this world is a result of the grace of God. And for that, we can never be thankful enough. But the greatest gift of God's grace is the gift of his own son. It's a gift. And every moment of every day, he gives you the opportunity to simply accept his gift, the gift of his own son, who suffered and died for you so you can be with him someday in heaven. Once again, that gift is extended. Jesus said, if you would accept that gift, then surrender your heart to him. You see such a wonderful, loving, merciful Savior who loves you more than anyone will ever love you. Surrender your heart to such a Savior. He'll save your soul, and he'll take you home with him someday to heaven. Brother Brian has a song selected to further encourage you to make that step. If you're ready to make that step, will you come as we stand and sing, please? <laughs>